You know, we've been talking about staying salty, salt. Salty, salt. Saying salt, right? We've been talking about staying salt over the last couple of weeks and you're doing series about that. And I believe this morning that God wants to unleash something new, a new fire, a new refreshing this morning. So I'm just gonna pray, but I want you almost as an act of obedience to God, ready to receive, to put your hands out and be expectant for God to speak to you this morning. So Father God, we just thank You, Lord. We thank You that Your Word is alive, that Your Word is living, Father God. It's not just pretty Scriptures. It's not just an old book that's very large to read, Father, but it is life. And so I pray, Father, that as we come around the Word, that You would bring fresh revelation, Father that You would bring refreshing, that You would bring fire, that You would stir us up in a way that we need to be stirred up this morning to be ambassadors for You. And so Father, we just thank You. We come with an expectant heart to receive from You and to hear from You this morning. Father, we don't want to leave the way that we came. Father, we came here to be touched by You, to be empowered by You, to be filled by You so that we could go out into the world, Lord, and that would what You have done in us would be outpoured through us. And so we just thank You for that this morning. In Jesus' Name, everyone who agrees and is expectant can say, Amen. Amen. All right, take a seat. Okay, if you haven't noticed, I'm very passionate. You may be weary at the end of this sermon. Um, But we're talking this morning about staying salt. You know, I am from Kendolan, like I said, I work um, with uh, Aboriginal health services and work a lot with our Indigenous community just in the area of mental health and wellbeing. And I love people. I love people. And so I love that this series that you're doing is really challenging us to love people. You know, I love that the Bible talks about us being ambassadors for Christ. You know, you know that every single person in this room, you are an ambassador for Christ. And often when we think of ambassadors, we think, you know, like of a person who's snooty and high up and a leader or whatever, but every single one of us is an ambassador for Christ in the sphere that God has placed us in. You know, what I love about God is that He's strategic. He's strategic. The fact that you're in the room is a strategic set up by God. If someone dragged you along, this is a stitch up by God (laughs) because He wants to meet with you this morning. You know, the street that you live on, you know, the place where you work, you know, the people in your family that you would rather not be in your family, they are strategically there by God because He has called you to be an ambassador not just Pastor Bill as an ambassador to Adelaide, not just Pastor Cass as an ambassador to the people in her world, but every single one of us, whether we met Jesus yesterday or we've known Him for 50 years, you are an ambassador. And the people in your world are who God has called you to reach, to be an ambassador for Christ for. And so as we are talking this morning about staying salt and being the salt and the light of the earth, about sharing our good story. I want you to be thinking of the people that God has strategically placed you. Who are you an ambassador to? Who are you an ambassador to? And I really believe that this morning, God is gonna put people in your mind, that people is gonna put people in your heart, that He is gonna stir up a new passion and a love for people this morning. So I want you to be thinking about that as we're talking this morning. So this morning, we're talking about having a better story. Who likes a better story? Yes, right, we have a better story. You know, I think sometimes as Christians living in a world where what we believe and what we value and what we stand upon is not necessarily considered popular. Has anyone found that? Like what we believe is not really like popular. In fact, it's often rejected, isn't it? And so often when we think about the fact that what we believe and what we stand for, what we have faith in, our morals and our values are not necessarily accepted by culture, we can forget the good news of the story. We can forget how good our story is. We can forget that the basis of everything that we believe is in fact a good story. That within the essence of faith, within the core of what we believe about a God who created us, 
who rescued us from ourselves, who sent His Son to bring a message of freedom, a message of love and a message of connection is actually a powerful and good story. You know, it's not only a good story, but it brings something to people's lives. You know, it's a message, it's a story, it's a faith, it's a belief that actually answers the existential questions that people are asking every day of their existence. A message that hits to the core of human longing and need in a way that no other story in humanity could ever tell. The core of what people are crying out for, the core of what people are desiring is found only in our story, only in the story of Jesus. You know, every solution that the world has to offer to these questions, the longings of the heart, are self-seeking. They're self-edifying. They're all about self. Have you heard people say, this is my truth? (laughs) You know, these kind of thinkings, you know, you walk through a bookstore and the self-help section is like the biggest section that there is because the world story offers only something that promotes self. But the message of God, the message that we believe, the good story that forms the basis of our faith is a message about a God who created us with intention, with purpose, and with connection. And even if we try to stray away from it, even if we try to live our own life, He came in human form to save us. That is a good story. Is that a good story this morning? Do you believe that it's a good story? You know, in Philippians 2, verses 6, it says that though He was God, He did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, He gave up His divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When He appeared in human form, He humbled Himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on the cross. You know, unlike the story that the world tells, this is a story about a God who denied His divinity, who who emptied Himself who emptied Himself, who became a slave so that we could have freedom, so that we could have connection, so that we could fulfil the longing of the human heart to connect with the Creator. It's not about self. It's about God coming down to earth and being a slave and dying a criminal's death so that we could find wholeness. I don't know about you, but that sounds like a pretty good story to me. Does that sound like a good story to you this morning? You know, in John 3, 16 to 18, and this is a verse that we all know, and I'm reading it from the Message Translation. It says, this is how much God loved the world. He gave His Son, His one and only Son, and this is why, so that no no one would be destroyed by believing in Him, and anyone can have whole and lasting life. God didn't go to all the trouble of sending His Son merely to appoint an accusing finger, telling the world how bad it was. He came to help to put the world right again. Anyone who trusts in Him is acquitted. Anyone who refuses to trust Him has long since been under the death sentence without knowing it. And why? Because that person fails to believe in um, the one and only Son and when we, introdu- when we introduce Him to Him. You know, people who try to make sense of the world are living a death sentence because they're not being able to fulfil the longing of the heart because what they truly desire is to connect with the Creator. You know, there's no other story, there's no other solution that the world can offer that compares to the good news story that we have. Do you know that this morning? because it's the only way that humanity can find wholeness. It is the only way that humanity can find wholeness. And I want you to know that this morning, because when we get that, when we understand that, we realise that our story that we have, the basis of our faith, our message, 
is not something that's outdated, but it is good news and it is powerful news and it has the power to transform our life and bring the wholeness that humanity is craving. As Christians, it's very easy to become insular. It's very easy even within the church to just be a little Christian club, isn't it? to just come to church, to fill the pews, to live our own life with God, holding on to our own message. That's not what Jesus came for. He came for us to be the deliverers of the message, to be ambassadors for Christ. That's what He came for. That's what He called us to. That is what we should do because the news is so great. Have you ever tried something, a product, and you'd be like, this is the best, and you tell everyone that it is the best. You gotta try it, you gotta try it, you gotta, you gotta get this, you gotta get this. You know, people hype things up, don't they? Can I tell you, Steph was hyping up the coffee from the coffee shop. <laughs> she was hyping it up, and I had two sips, it's pretty good. I gotta tell you, it's pretty good. But when someone tries something that they like, when they believe the message is good, you can't help but tell everyone, can you? And so we as Christians, we don't wanna be a little Christian club because what differentiates us from the bingo club down the road? Nothing. We have the message of God. We have the good news. We have what the people out there are longing for. And it is good news. It's not outdated. It is good news. The message of Christ is one of power, It's one of love, it's one of grace, it's one of freedom, it's one of peace. It's exciting, it's exciting. Do you believe that the Gospel is exciting? And more than that, it has the power to answer the questions of the human heart that are longing to find the answer to who am I? What am I here for? And who do I belong? Do you know that every heart, whether you're a person of faith, whether you're looking for God or not, every human heart is asking questions of identity, purpose and belonging. Doesn't matter what culture you are. It doesn't matter what your experience is. It doesn't matter what your intellect is. Every person within yourself, even now, I know every single person here has asked, who am I? What am I here for? Who do I belong to? Where can I find community? Where can I find belonging and connection? You know, when sin entered the world and separated us from our Creator, that desire for connection, purpose and identity became the longing of the heart. Because sin stands in the way of us being connected to God, to our Creator and living in the wholeness that we were created for. You know, who in the room likes flat packs? Anyone? No takers? Kathy loves a flat pack. I can see that. I can see that you'd like a flat pack. My husband's a builder, right? And so when we get flat packs, he refuses to read the instructions because he spent four years getting an apprenticeship and he has worked for 20 years in the construction trade and he does not need a piece of paper from Ikea to tell him how to put some screws and to use a, what's that thing called? Allen key. He doesn't need to do that. I can tell you that there is very minimal amount of flat packs that have entered my house that have been successful. In fact, I feel like my husband would be, would be better chopping down a tree, carving out the pieces of wood and building it from scratch than the flat pack because he refuses to read the instructions. You know, the instructions are important because they're written by the people who created the, the piece, the furniture. And the same is true with humanity. If something is broken or is in pieces, we need to look to the Creator of humanity to know how to fix it. You know, we have this manual and from start to finish, it's about a God who created us and about His plan for humanity. And so when we look back into Genesis at creation, which is where God created humanity, we see what humanity was designed for in its most purest form. You know what creation tells us about God? It tells us that God is eternal. He has no rival, He has no equal. Do you love professing that when we sing that song? You have no rival, you have no equal, now and forever. 
our God reigns. That's what it says. That's our God has no evil, our, no evil. He has no evil as well, but he has no equal. <laughs> he talks about a God who is the creator, a God who is the source of life, a God who is good, not just in part, but in essence, every part of him, he's good. His character, his nature is good. It talks about a God who is personal and wants to draw near to us. You know, He delights in nurturing His creation. A God who created humanity in His likeness. A God who desires to be in close and intimate relationship with us, with humanity. You know, what creation story also reveals is that humans are designed and created for purpose and meaning and connection with God. You know, and up until the fall, when sin entered the world, that's exactly how Adam and Eve lived. And you know what God said? This is good. This is good. You know, Ecclesiastes um, 3 verses 11 talks about God setting eternity in the hearts of all men. You know, the creation story reveals to us that hardwired into every human being is this longing and connection with the Creator for intimacy with the Creator. Because in that connection with our Creator that we find our true identity, that we find purpose, that we find meaning. Now we can look at the world and we can see brokenness. I think you could ask any person on the planet, is there brokenness in the world? And they would be able to point it out. In fact, I think they would be able to identify it. Pastor Bill even shared some of the brokenness that he saw in the four weeks when he was away. But it's clear that there's brokenness in the world. You know, whether you're of faith or not, there is brokenness. There's no denying the brokenness. You know, and at times when we look at the brokenness, we can feel really overwhelmed. At times we can feel really helpless when we look at the way that the world is heading. Have you ever been in conversations about cultural issues or social issues or the way things are going and you're just like, I don't know what the answer is, you all need Jesus. Like, do you know what I'm talking about? That kind of feeling is like, I don't know what it is, everyone just needs Jesus. But isn't that the truth? They do need Jesus. We all need Jesus. And you know, that hopeless feeling that we can feel because we're feeling like the world is moving further and further away from the good news story. You know, it's moving further and further. But as we look at the world, what do we see? The world is trying to save itself. It's trying to fix its own brokenness. But in the way that it does that, everything that the world does to try and save itself or to try and fix itself, every way that a human tries to, to repair the brokenness in their own life is just a counterfeit of Jesus. It's a counterfeit of Jesus. And what is happening in the world shouldn't scare us. It should not scare us because we hold the answer to what the heart is longing for. We hold the answer to the brokenness. We hold the answer to the longing of the heart. You know, those that are longing, the emptiness, they can't fill it on their own. The only way that it can be filled is with Jesus. And they find wholeness in Jesus by coming back into connection with their creator, creator. So no matter what's happening in culture, no matter how far people are running from God, remember that God created them. He hardwired people to be built with a desire and a longing to connect with Him. He placed eternity in the hearts of all men. You know, my son, um, on Christmas, he got a, he's a five-year-old and we got him a remote control car. Don't you love remote control cars at Christmas? And um, he was so excited, opened it up, was just like, yes, this is exactly what I wanted. But I actually had a massive parent fail, <laughs> a massive parent fail. And if you're a parent in the room, I want you to learn. If this is the only thing you take away from the message, it will be helpful. <laughs> I didn't buy batteries. <laughs> And so my son, he has his remote control car and he's like, you know, we don't have the batteries, but he doesn't care, he rips it open. 
and he gets it out and he's trying to drive it. And I don't know if you've ever driven a remote control car yourself, but he's like, eh, 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 like trying to drive it along. At one point, he got a piece of string and he tried it around the front and he's dragging it along, along the road. And as he's doing that, the car's beginning to break. And I'm like, well, that was a waste of money. But he's dragging along and the car begins to break. It begins to kind of like fall apart and it's not working as it should. Um, and so as he's doing that and the car's beginning to break, it just shows a message, it just shows us because the car was designed to work with batteries. The way that the car would be able to work effectively and to its full potential is if it has batteries. For it to operate as it was designed, it needed batteries. It needed be, to be connected to power. It needed to be connected to the source. You know, these complex social issues the way that the world is moving is exactly the same as my son's car. <laughs> a means of trying to operate without the intimacy of the Father. And you know, we need the intimacy of the Father to fulfil our design. That's our life source. And so we can see the world trying to operate like that remote control car without batteries. But what does that, what do they need? They need the batteries to be able to operate at full potential. The same is true with humanity. They can go squeaking along as much as they want. They can make themselves wrecked and broken and try to find a way to operate at full potential. But the batteries that they need is a connection with God. And that's really what they are clinging to. That's really what they are design, designing. Now we aren't remote control cars, but the same principle applies. We need our God connection. We need relationship and intimacy with our God. It's like every single person sort of has this antenna, like beep, beep, beep. Where I live, a lot of people have satellite because we live so far apart. They don't necessarily have lines running to them. So a lot of things work on this satellite and it's like it beeps like beep, beep, beep. Beep, beep, trying to pick up the frequency of connection. It's like all of them have this longing and that's that antenna beeping, you know, trying to connect with God. And at times they connect with other things, but it doesn't last, does it? And so humanity is walking around with like this longing, this desire to wanna connect with God, like that antenna. And what we see happening in culture is people are trying to self-govern themselves. They're trying to be their own God, trying to find means of fulfilling the longing of their heart. They're trying to answer those questions of identity and purpose in other people, in things, in belongings, in possessions. You know, the Bible calls that idolatry. And that's what humanity is trying to do. In Romans 1.25, it says, they exchange the truth about God, the good story about God for a lie and they worshipped and serviced the creature rather than the Creator. No, it doesn't matter what people do. Everything that the world has to offer is never going to satisfy them. We know that in our own lives, don't we? We're not satisfied with the things of the world. You know, we as a church have two ways of seeing what's happening out there. We can see it as people rejecting God or we can see it as people seeking for connection with their Creator. And even if they don't see it like that, we can see it like that. Even if they don't know that that's what's happening, that is what's happening. They are seeking a connection with the Creator because that is innate in every single one of us by design. The reality is that even if they are rejecting God, their soul is craving Him. You know, in Psalms 27, Verse four, David writes, here's the only thing that I crave from Yahweh, the one thing that I seek above all else. I want to live every moment in His house, beholding the marvellous beauty of Yahweh, filled with awe, delighting in His glory and grace. The one thing his soul craves, the one thing that he desires. And he's writing that passage from a real moment of difficulty and hardship, but he desires it, he craves it because it's innate in all of us to do that. You know, I have this lady in my life and um, she's a very 
spiritual person, a very spiritual person. She talks about her spirituality being like a jewelry box and she just picks and dabbles in whatever she wants to dabble that requires what she needs. And uh, she's not interested in God, no way. Not interested in institutions, not interested in religion, hates it, blames religion for everything. And Sometimes that's true. But you know, she's not interested. But her granddaughter was doing something at church and she came to church. And from the moment that she walked in, she just started bawling her eyes out. Absolutely bawling her eyes out. Like, you know, we're singing praise songs and she's bawling her eyes out. We're shaking hands and greeting people and she's bawling her eyes out. And at the end of the service, I said to her, what did you think? She said, oh, there's something in this room. Something in this room that just gave me a peace I've never experienced before. I connected to something I've never connected to before. You know what that was? Her soul craving the connection with her God. And she comes back. She doesn't like God. She doesn't like religion. She doesn't like the institution of the church but she keeps coming back because her soul is addicted to the connection she finds when she's in praise and worship with her Creator. And that's exactly what happens with all of humanity. We, they are craving, we are craving. In this room, we are craving connection with our Saviour. When you get into the presence of God, what happens? It brings transformation in our life. We experience peace. We experience love. We experience joy. That's why David says, the one thing that I desire is to dwell in the house of the Lord all of my days because it's what we were designed for. It's how we were designed to live. You know, all the brokenness in our planet, both with and without, within and without, is ultimately the consequence of sin and not allowing God to be God. In 1 John 2 verses 2, it says, He Himself is a sacrifice that atones for our sin and not only our sin, but the sins of the world. You know what atone means? It means to provide or serve as compensation for. He made a way that we could come back into connection with God. Jesus made a way out of the brokenness and we have to be the sign that points people back towards wholeness. That's what being an ambassador is, isn't it? Pointing people back to Jesus. People need wholeness. We need wholeness. And that can only be found in God. It can only be found when we are in connection and relationship with Him. You know, Matthew 5, 13 to 16 from the Message Translation is a passage of Scripture that I love. It says, let me tell you why you're here. Anyone wanna know why they're here? Yes? You are here to be salt seasoning that brings out the God flavours of this earth. If you lose your saltiness, how will people taste godliness? Should I repeat that? If you lose your saltiness, how will people taste godliness? If you don't believe in the goodness of the message of the gospel, how will people come into wholeness with their creator? You've lost your usefulness and will end up in the garbage. In other words, we as a church might as well be a bingo club. Here is another way to put it. You're here to be light, bringing out the God colours in the world. God is not a secret to be kept. Did you hear that this morning? Our message is good news. It's not a secret to be kept. We're going public with this, as public as a city on a hill. I live in the country, so when I'm driving on those old country roads and I see the lights of the city, you know what it speaks to me of? Attractiveness. <laughs> I'm excited. God has called us to be a city on a hill that attracts people to God. If I make you light bearers, you don't think I'm gonna hide you under a bucket, do you? I'm putting you on a light stand. Now that I've put you there on a hilltop, on a light stand, shine. Keep open house. 
that strategic house that you've been placed in as an ambassador. Be generous with your lives by opening up to others with your good news story, with the love of God that's within you, with the power of the Holy Spirit that is also within you. You will prompt people to open up to God, this generous Father in heaven. We are called to bring out the God flavours of the world. We are called to bring out the God colours. And he has positioned each and every one of us strategically as ambassadors to shine. My question this morning is, have you lost your saltiness? Have you lost your saltiness? Have you forgotten the power of the gospel? Have you forgotten that what you believe in is actually good news that has the power to transform and change the lives of the people that God has put in your life? Have you forgotten that you were actually designed, the sole purpose that you are on this earth is to connect with the Father, to worship the Father, to be in continual relationship with Him. That is what God created us for. That is what God designed us for. And if we don't outwork that, if we don't live that, if we don't share that, we're like that remote control car that's just bobbling along, falling apart because it's not operating with batteries. You know, I had a vision once when I was at my church, I used to live in Orange, and I was standing in the church, just in the foyer, and um, at the end of the street was like houses. You looked out over houses, it was on a T intersection. And I remember just being there and just praying for the community and praying for the town. And I felt like God just showed me this picture. And it was the people in the street, they were walking back and forth to their mailbox. You know, they were at their front door, open the door, walk out, check the mailbox, go back, walk back inside. And I thought, geez, this is weird. What is this about? Like, what, what are they doing, God? And then I turned around in the church of the foyer and floor to ceiling, I saw letters, these envelopes, these letters. And God said, I've written a love letter to every single one of them. And they're going out, checking their mailbox to see if it's been delivered, to see if it's there. You have love letters for the people in your world. It's called good news. <laughs> it is good news. It is the message of gospel, the gospel. It is the love of Jesus that they are looking for. They are checking the mailbox and they are finding catalogs that are entertaining them for a period of time, but they're not sustaining them because what they desire is a handwritten love note from the creator with instructions on how to live their life and find wholeness in him. We gotta be salty. We gotta be salty because the people in our world are depending on us to bring the good news. Will you be salty this morning? You know, I was sharing in the earlier service that my grandma, she loves salt. We are bred to love salt. If you cut our arteries open, they would be clogged with salt, <laughs> right? Not a great health thing, but that's how we are. And when my grandma buys a new salt shaker, she gets out her drill and she drills a hole in the salt shaker. In the Murphy family, we do not shake salt, we pour it. <laughs> Our tomato on toast looks like tomato in snowflakes of salt. <laughs> but that's how we gotta be. Sometimes as a church, we're like, oh yeah, I'll sprinkle a little bit of salt on that. You know, I'll shake a little bit here and there. God wants you to pour out, to be salty in a way that's pouring out. That is what He wants for you. And there's people in your world who depend on you pouring out the salt. And so I wanna encourage you this morning, I'm gonna finish in a minute and maybe someone can come up on the piano. Maybe this morning you have forgotten to be salty. Maybe you've been overwhelmed with the things that you have going on in your life. Maybe you're overwhelmed by the complexities of life. 
Maybe you've been coming to church and you've just been playing the church game. But this morning you're like, I've got to stop just playing church. I've got to realise that God has called me. He has saved me and called me to be salt to the people in the world. He's offering you the opportunity to be an ambassador. Are you gonna be an ambassador this morning? Can I get you all to stand? I'm gonna pray over all of us collectively, but then I'm gonna ask this morning if maybe you feel like you need a little bit of a refire. (laughs) Maybe you need God to just give you a little bit of a touch of His love for the people in your world. I'm gonna pray for you and I'm gonna believe that God is going to unleash something on you in the way that you love people. Father God, we just thank You this morning. Father, I thank You for every person in the room, Lord. Father, I thank You for every person that they also represent. Father, the people that You have called them to be ambassadors to. Lord, I pray that we would not be a church that plays church or or conducts religious practice, Father, but we would be a church that believe in the power of the Gospel, that we would be a church that are confident in the power of the Gospel to transform people's lives. Father, I pray that in this room, we would be people who take seriously the call to be ambassadors for Christ. Lord, I pray, Father, that in this 1030 service, Father, we are gonna see the fruit of us acting in our role as ambassadors for You. Father, I thank You for the people that You've placed in our life. Lord, I pray for a supernatural boldness. I pray for a supernatural confidence. Lord, I thank You that Your Word says it isn't about eloquency or our ability to talk, Father, but I thank You we'd even have a revelation that we carry the Spirit of the living God with us in everywhere that we go, that longing and connection that people have to connect with the Holy Spirit is picked up when they have conversations with us. Father, just like my friend who isn't interested in God or religion or anything is craving the connection of the Holy Spirit, the connection with her Creator. Father, I pray that that would be evident in our conversations, that the Holy Spirit within us would leak out of us. Father, that we would be like the city on the hill that is attractive, Father. Lord, I thank You that that is what You've called us to. I thank You that that is what You've also equipped us to. And I thank You that the story that You gave, Father, the Son that You gave, Father, made a way so that every single person could come into relationship with their Creator. And we just thank You for that. In Jesus' Name. Everyone who believes that says, 